Walter Burgund is in the house. Thank you very much, Laurel, for your very warm introduction tonight. Party executive members, led by my personal and special advisor, never miss a PNM meeting as long as there is one. I want to begin tonight's meeting in a very special way. In 1981, I was a candidate in a general election in Tobago. And one of my colleagues in that lineup was Amoy Muhammad under George Chambers as the Prime Minister. We've lost Amoy Muhammad. A soul has passed on. And tonight in a PNM meeting, I'd like to ask all of you to stand for a moment in recognition of her passing. Thank you very much. A former member of parliament for Princess Town, representing the PNM, and a parliamentary secretary in the cabinet. I tell you that, ladies and gentlemen, because I genuinely believe that public service is honorable. And those of our citizens who, from time to time, would have offered themselves and would have been selected by various communities, sometimes small communities, as electoral districts in the Tobago House of Assembly, a councillor in a corporation in Trinidad, a member of the cabinet, or wider responsibility as opposition leader or prime minister. These are serious responsibilities and honorable positions. So ladies and gentlemen, when we have the PNM, would have come from an organization that was put together by teachers who drove Dr. Williams and encouraged him to form this party in 1956. And we are still here today providing guidance and leadership to the country. We can do nothing else but feel proud of the journey that we've traveled and the work that we do for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Political parties like ours and others, I would say, have a mission. And it's largely based on a vision for doing better for the country, improving the country, improving the lives of the people we represent. And to do so, you need to win friends and influence people. It's not everybody who will buy into your argument in the beginning. Many men have got their wives after a lot of trying and sometimes tribulations. But then you go through life satisfied that you've done your best and you may have got the woman of your choice or the job of your aspiration. So tonight in the PNM, after we presented ourselves to the country, as we have been doing on an ongoing basis, we expect that some of our citizens would listen to us and see the rectitude of our cause, see the record of our performance and move their position from where they were to where they now want to be. Welcome, Fish. Welcome, Mr. Sanka. <laughs> A political party would be successful, not if you only pander to your base who support you for all kinds of reasons, but you have to be continuously winning friends and influencing people. And based on the record of the PNM, in Trinidad and Tobago, I am not surprised that we are winning more friends and influencing more people. <laughs> Tonight, as leader of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and as leader of this nation, I was particularly pleased that an idea that we introduced to the country 
by the formation and establishment of a new ministry, a ministry of youth development, could have been managed by two ministers, first Fitzgerald Hines and now Foster Cummings, and to have been able to give you a report like Foster Cummings gave you tonight, then you know our young people are in good hands and their future is secure. And I will go further to say that there's no other political organization that was or is charged with responsibility in this country that could even begin to point you to any such performance in the interest of young people and their future in Trinidad and Tobago. None. None. And that is one of 23 ministries. If I had brought the Minister of Health here tonight, you'd have got a similar report. If I have brought the Minister of Education, you'd have got a similar report. If I had brought the Minister of Local Government, you'd have got a similar report. If I had brought the Minister of Public Utilities, you'd have got a similar report. Because these would have been PNM ministers reporting for the duty that they have carried out. That's what it is. And this country ought not to take that for granted. When you listen to the range of government programs, and then you still think that there are some people who are outside of those programs, didn't catch all of them, you can't catch all of them. But the stream is there. Ladies and gentlemen, a simple matter like, you know, matriculating and presenting to this country a few hundred new farmers is a seminal development. You know why? Because my grandfather, my father and their friends, they've all passed on. We don't have a replenishment of farmers. And it is from that understanding that the government has got into the business of creating farmers from young people. Farming is an honorable profession, feeding the nation. You all remember early in the COVID, what our biggest issue was over and above the virus killing people? Is that those who are alive might starve to death because food was becoming unavailable. And all of a sudden they realize that the farmer is very important because he creates the food from planting the seed to breeding the animal to create meat. So ladies and gentlemen, one thing you know in Trinidad and Tobago is that your government understands the problems and set about to solve them. And that Ministry of Youth Development is one of the solutions that was presented to this nation by the PNM government. And I feel so proud and so satisfied when I see these numbers of young people showing interest in what is offered to them. And we only have to do more and more of that. And every one of them that we give an opportunity successfully, and every one that we guide away from somebody who will treat them as collateral damage or dispensable product, and some parent who couldn't manage a youngster, male or female, and the government program offered them a pathway to a good life, to be a productive citizen, then we know that the government is impacting lives and success is attending our, at, uh, uh, our programs along the way. These are the things we can talk about. I'm sure tonight, for the tens of thousands of people who would have heard what was said by these two ministers, they would have learned something about their country and many would have taken decisions on a positive way as to what to do going forward. I know that because a PNM meeting is an educational experience for the country. <laughs> on the contrary, there are other colleagues of ours in the political arena Every Sunday and every Monday night is the foulest of the foul. And all they do is attack personalities, tell lies, and mislead the population. Sometimes I wonder if they genuinely believe that what they say, and like the more nasty they say, they believe that the more impressive it will be. And you ask yourself, suppose you put God out your thoughts and put that group of people in charge of the nation's affairs. What will be the outcome? What will be the outcome? But you see, when you have, if you belong, I mean, if, you, 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 if you're in resources, right, you, you look at the race track in Arima, near Arima, race track in Arima, something like that. There's something with horses called pedigree. If you want a good race horse, you don't just go and buy one that look good or making noise. 
you have to find out what is this record, what is the lineage, what, what is the pedigree of this animal. It's the same thing in politics. If you want to get a good outcome from management of a country, you have to find out the pedigree of the political party that offers itself. What is your track record? And you could, have the, you could have the record of the angel Gabriel. There will be people who will say you're not good enough. But by and large, the average citizen will know and be able to differentiate between what is good, what is better, what is best, and what is outright bad. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are in Trinidad and Tobago. And we, in the PMM, we have no difficulty in standing next to our record because our record is good. It's good. <laughs> and to find that record, you have to look into the history of Trinidad and Tobago to understand what the PNM is going through right now. When Dr. Williams brought party politics into Trinidad and Tobago, our country was a little backward colonial backwater in the British Empire. And when we got it, even before independence, when we got responsibility for managing the affairs, there was something that was scarce in this country. Money. Money was scarce. But if you know the Calypsoos of our country, where our stories are told and our history is written, you know what Calypso called the doctor say? The doctor say to pay as you earn, and Sparrow sang that Caliph, so it became a national anthem because Dr. Williams and the PNM, Dr. Williams and the PNM realized that there was a plethora of problems in this country, but there was a potential for progress. But for that progress to be had, there has to be some kind of income in the hands of the government to spend on the things that had to be done. And the PNM exposed itself to pay a political price by doing the right thing, the visionary thing. And that thing was, if you have an income, the government will take a small portion from each person. It's called income tax. And that will give a pool of money to the government to do the things that had to be done. Income tax was introduced in Trinidad and Tobago. And the country went up almost in flames led by a few people who believe that that must not happen. Must not happen. And usually the people who could manage to pay it are the ones leading the charge. And the ones who don't have to pay it follow them. But Dr. Williams believed in the good sense of the average person. The Minister of Finance almost lost his job. I don't know how many of you know how many to be good and was in the government. But A.N.R. Robinson was in the government as Minister of Finance. He was the only Deputy Prime Minister in Trinidad and Tobago. Minister of Finance, I'm going to introduce income tax. And of course, as you see now, what's happening now? We're talking about a tax to be as dramatic and as progressive as that. And what is the reaction? There are people who have not learned. Income tax was introduced in a budget that was a couple, of, a few hundred million dollars worth. But you were able to build school, introduce standpipe, build health center, hire a few more nurses, eradicate some chronic diseases. Yes, that's what they did. And all of a sudden, the quality of life in the country began to change have a national housing program that's how to build houses for people. Carinad, Charlottesville, go through this country and see the first set of NHA houses. And the families in there, sometimes it's the first time they ever had a flushing toilet. Latrin pathway, flushing toilet come. Education, like people like me, I'm the last of six boys. I'm the only one that went to high school. Income tax. Today, Income tax in Trinidad and Tobago is accepted as a normal and reasonable way to get a revenue stream 
to do the things that you need to get done on a normal day and you take it for granted. In our national budget, today that Bacchanal of early puts into the budget $25 billion. There are some countries that would not have accomplished that. And that $25 billion would have stayed in the hands of a few people. And the end result of that is that that country would have been lopsided where a small group of people kept everything that the country had to offer, kept it unto themselves, wealthy beyond belief, and the vast majority of the others live in abject poverty, perpetual poverty and hopelessness. That's how it happens. But the PNM in Trinidad and Tobago ensured that that didn't happen here by taking a small amount from people gives you a budget and once you get that budget where you have a stream coming in doesn't matter how large the stream is but because you have it coming in on a consistent basis you can now go and borrow borrow large amounts of money because time will not work for you you borrow a large amount of money you get it this year you begin to spend it this year on things this year and over time you repay that money and that is how borrowing is made to work for you. But you carry a debt that you have to service, but that debt could be paid because you have a revenue stream. And of course, those persons who are least able to pay, pay the least because it's a graduated scale. And today in our income tax arrangements, a significant portion of people about 65,000 people or more. You don't pay if you earn, was it seven, seven, once your earnings is $7,000 or less, you pay no income tax. <laughs> At first it was 5,000, then it was 6,000, now 7,000. If you're earning more than 7,000 a month, they take a little bit from you. If you're earning 20000 a month, they take a certain amount from you. And if you're earning 40000 a month, they take a bit more. It's the, the more you earn, the more you pay. That's why it's called P-A-Y-E, pay as you earn. That is the PNM doing the right thing for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And it wasn't easy. It was not easy. There was a lot of opposition to it. Because there always is... So today, after years of hearing about local government reform and how important local government is, because local government is where the government authorities service you at your doorstep, in your backyard, on your street, in your community, in your borough. For decades we have been talking about how unacceptable the level of service was and how good it can be. At first, local government was counties, County St. Patrick's and David, way out in the east, County Carney, County Victoria, County St. George East, County St. George West. That was the arrangement. And you had your county councils making progress, but making it slowly, but could make much more. A lot of these local roads in these areas were built by those county councils. A lot of the farmers then were supported by county councils. Long ago, when you were a county councillor, you were a huge part of the national development. Then, over time, there were changes to that. Another government came in somewhere along the way. After PNM was in government for 30 years, the NAR came in and they made some adjustments to local government. We went into municipal corporations. So now, what used to be St. George West is now Diego Martin. Is, no, that, that, that's the kind of progress we've made. And then we went further. Under the Patrick Manning government, we had... A lot of work done by Hazel Mannings and her team. Then Frankie Khan came in under by stewardship on his team. And all of them worked towards examining local government, consulting the country, consult and consult and consult in all the corners of Trinidad because Tobago had a different solution on the way. It's about 40 years now Tobago has a THA in Trinidad. We see what works. 
if there is a revenue stream at the local level, there's a whole lot more you can do than if you are there waiting on pittances to be let out to you at the time. Especially, especially if you have people in office who are doing what Lisa said tonight. Come representing a party. Collect the stipend for being a good boy in the party. But you couldn't care less about doing anything at the place you're supposed to be working. Not plenty of those. Take the title for the stipend. But in the PNM, we believe that we can bring genuine improvement to the quality of your life by having local government reform. So we got it all done. And my colleague, the member of parliament for San Fernando East, San Fernando West, sorry. What's, what's wrong with San Fernando East tonight? <laughs> Yeah, I admire the enthusiasm of the member for San Fernando West. He worked at the HDC before. He was in local government. He was in the Attorney General's office. He has a genuine energy for doing these kinds of things. And he led the team to convert the thoughts and the vision of local government reform into law. So we had the document that went to the parliament. And of course, as is to be expected, our colleagues in the parliament want no part of it. You wouldn't believe that these people who spent all their waking moments in the previous years talking about local government, local government, local government. There are 14 corporations in Trinidad. We control seven, now they control seven you would think that they would have been excited about local government reform when we're talking about greater responsibility, greater fiscal strength, greater improvement in the quality of life in the country. You would think that those people would at least say, here it is. Some aspect of sharing of the authority for managing the country, you would think they would want that. No. Like everything else, including child marriage, they oppose it. We go to court, we go to parliament to stop to prevent child marriage, prevent men of whatever age from marrying girls at 9 and 10 and 12 and 14. So opposed were they to that. And so were they to defend the status quo. They bring specialist child marriage people in the parliament to put up argument to maintain it. That's what they've done. The other day when I said that in the parliament, they get up on 48 one saying I am accusing them, I am, I am embarrassing them. I didn't say that. I'm just quoting what you have done. Tell me you didn't do that. Tell me that in Trinidad and Tobago, there wasn't a, a bill in the parliament to end child marriage. And you couldn't even rely on those who were in the parliament to oppose it. You bring in specialists. And that's what happened. That's what they are. So local government, they oppose and opposing it on the grounds that you're going to have to pay property tax. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you have no property, you have no property tax to pay. And all those who are talking about that, who have property abroad, they are the first in line to pay it out there. And of course, if you have property and you have difficulty for reasons that can be established in paying this tax, there is provision in the law for the Minister of Finance to give you an exemption. But you have to establish that it is so. Not that you don't want to pay it, but if you, for example, let's say, for example, you are somebody who is on government help already because we have 65,000 people who get government grants to help them get along during the year. Some of those people have houses, and such persons can make a case that they can't pay the tax. There's provision for them not to pay. But of the other 400,000 people, 400,000 houses in the country, the average person can pay an average price. And the average price you're talking about is about twelve or $1,300 a year. That's $3 a day? Mm -hmm. Less than a dynamite. Right? But when you do that, because it's a large number of people, in the same way as the PAYE that Dr. Williams looked at in the early days, where a large number of people 
each paying a small amount gives you a significant pool of funds which is now to be hypothecated for a particular purpose. We said to, look, to them, the money that we're going to get for local government will be collected by local government, kept by local government, and spent by local government for local government districts. What more do you want? But they will oppose it. They will oppose it. It's not supposed to happen. They like what they have now. They want election, election, election. Let's suppose that we leave it the way it is. Do nothing. We have the election. And the election is day 10. Let's say 10 of February is the election. Okay. On the 11th, you know who wins the election. But to what purpose? <clears throat> to what purpose? To continue the same thing that you have been saying is not working and is not doing anything for you? And all the visions of doing better, the election come and gone, and you have not offered a single change to improve it? Well, the PNM is saying that there's a, there's a purpose for the election. Our purpose in the election coming up whenever the day is called is to bring about change in local government. That's what it's about. Win, lose, or draw, our mission is to continue to improve the quality of life in this country by improving local government delivery. And an integral part of that is what is the revenue stream that local government will have? How can we strengthen it? How can we better it? And ladies and gentlemen, we come to the point where the law was passed. And the law said that local government will now no, no longer be for 36 months. It will be for 48 months. Giving the council a reasonable time to plan and execute and to serve and then to come back to Parliament. The four-year term is already practicing Tobago. The Tobago House of Assembly gets elected for a four-year term. I haven't heard anybody saying it is too long or it is too short. It is reasonable. So a four-year term replaced the Tobago County Council three-year term. So we've done that before. Why are they beating up like that as though you're cut off a chicken head under a basket? Why are they behaving like that? We have practiced it. We have seen the result. I challenge any of you in this room here in Great Malabar to tell me that you are not impressed with the condition of Tobago in terms of its cleanliness, its service, because Tobago people in the THA arrangement, they handle a revenue stream and they use it on a consistent basis. As I say that, I want to acknowledge my friend Bali, the tomato boy here with us tonight. Bali, acknowledge him. He knows what I'm talking about. He knows that I'm talking about he's a businessman. You could go to the bank and borrow, not Bali, but other people. You could go to the bank and borrow $100 million because you have $5 million coming in on a consistent basis. And if Bali can do it, Nancy will do it. Right? Once you have a revenue stream, you can do wonders. How many of you in this room have a mortgage? Right, because you have a house. You have a house. You didn't wait until you save up all the money to go and build or buy the house. You have a stream like a job, you have a salary or something, you go to the bank and you borrow money, you buy, build a nice house, and then you spend time now paying for it. In the meantime, it's appreciating in value, so over at the end of the whole thing, you would have got the benefit of your investment. It's the same thing in infrastructure in a community. But you want all of these things, but you don't want to change it. Change brings conflict, but without change there is no success. We want success, so we're going to make the change, and we're going to fight the country. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we passed the law to do a particular thing, to give you a four-year term. And the law is written that those who are in office on the three-year term, there's a, there is some significant transition to take place because we are talking about significant change. A simple thing like the, the organizational structure of your corporation. To move from the do nothing one to do plenty things. It has to be some transitional arrangement. So we ask for the extra year for a particular purpose. And we're on track to do that. 
we now discover that the one who has run to court as a man of straw is really them. If you hear them in the parliament, we went to the Privy Council and we win and we, we, we now know who the we is. We now know who the we is. Right? Man of straw going to court. But of course, there's an issue of interpretation. Our majority in the parliament acting on its own and alone as the PNM sometimes always does. Anything big and good in this country to be done, the PNM usually have to stand alone to get it done. Whether it is the purchase of Texaco, the coming of the unit trust, free secondary education, the PNM has to stand alone to get it done or it does not get done. So in the parliament, we stood alone and passed the law for local government reform. We're standing alone and passing the law for the revenue authority. And of course, in passing the law, we interpreted what we wanted to do. They challenged us in the court. The first judge said, the government is right. They said, we're going to appeal it. They said, all an interpretation, eh? The second judge says, three judges look at it and say, the government is right. They said, we're going to appeal to the Privy Council. Go to the Privy Council. Five judges. Two said the government is right, three said the government is wrong. But that is the Privy Council, that is the final position. Oh, God, oh. The UNC finally have something to campaign on. The UNC finally have something to campaign on. Because they win in the Privy Council. They win in the Privy Council. And you mustn't mention, you mustn't mention that we had won in the High Court. And we mustn't mention that we had won in the Appeal Court. No, no, no. The government is not wicked. The government is led by a dictator. The government breached the Constitution. And they carry on non-stop under the... The, the yellow peril that is in front of you all the time. But they have no regard for truth even in their foolishness. In the very decision where this matter of an interpretation went through three layers of court. And up until the 17th of May, the government's interpretation prevailed. On the 18th of May, the Privy Council changed it by saying, no, our interpretation by majority is that it shouldn't go that way. We civilized people. Our highest court says so. There's a fix to it. The Prime Minister comes to the country and says to you, we'll go to the Parliament. This is the fix. And we have done that. Done it. <laughs> but in the meantime, people who have not a single policy program and a terrible record upsetting the entire country on their interpretation that Trinidad and Tobago is in trouble. So much trouble that the opposition leader, that idler, she writes, she writes a letter to the CARICOM secretariat on this matter indicating that Trinidad and Tobago is in this great difficulty where the government is no longer observing the laws and the people's rights and the concept, all that kind of rubbish, right? <laughs> and that is what they have do. Because if you, if you don't have nothing, if you don't have nothing to say to people that make sense, you, but you must talk foolishness. Because according to Patrick Manning, they got to say something, right? But look at this something. Even though the judgment says in English, there is no breach of the Constitution. How many days and nights you hear these jokers accusing the government of affecting your constitutional rights? But the, the judgment itself says so, you know. To make it clear. You think that stopped them from doing that? And they're so upset about this dangerous thing that happened in the country that they want election observers to observe the local government election. I want Ole here in Malabar and the rest of the country to help them observe the licking that they will get on election day. <laughs> they are on a perpetual
perpetual campaign of bad mouthing and misrepresenting this country. I'm not saying for one minute that we don't have problems. I'm not saying for one minute that the PNM is perfect. But I could tell you, without fear of contradiction, because I talk to my CARICOM colleagues all the time, from Bahamas to Suriname, from Belize to Antigua, what Foster Cummings outlined here tonight as government programs for young people in a nation doesn't exist anywhere else in CARICOM. Doesn't. Doesn't. But if you listen to them, if you listen to them, there's never a day when you can wake up and say, what a lovely day. Beautiful sunshine. Let me go on the beach. Let me go see my neighbor. I haven't talked to John for a while. No, no, no. Just, just, every day. Because they have nothing useful to tell you. And I ask you as a population, for your sake and for God's sake, to ignore the UNC. The other day, the other day, I noticed there are two words being used by the opposition leader. One to describe my workload, and I'm lazy. The other one is the word shame. I don't have to sit here tonight and tell you how hard I work. That's not for me to do, right? That's for you to judge. The cabinet I lead, let them talk. But I could show you some results. I could show you some results. You see what Foster Cummings mentioned there? All those wonderful things? Former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Mr. Eddie Siaga, said, you could care as much as you like, but it takes cash to care. Everything that he mentioned has to be paid for. You, you, you give a big round of applause when you heard that the Shagaramas Convention Center will be converted into a, a youth facility. Yes, that cabinet approved that already. $60 million that will cost. $60 million. You saw there, there, there was a fire in St. Jude's home where those young girls are, the girls who are awarded the state and so on. In St. Jude's home, fireplace burning cannot be used. And they've moved into brand new premises in what used to be St. Michael's in Diego Martin. How did they move inside there? Because the road is dead? Because we spent $20 million upgrading that place, and it, it, as God have it, it was ready and available so the young girls are put inside there. Otherwise, ask yourself, where would they have gone? Where would they have been put? You go down to St. James in the morning, every morning, and I look at it, and these things are important to me. I look at it every morning, and I see people, citizens from all walks of life, young and old, going to St. James to get them medical care, many of them being treated for serious and not so serious cancer, all cancer serious. And they go there. There's a lineup machine in there. The government bought it and put it there. That costs 70, $75 million. These are expenses, right? Eh? These are expenses. We offer public servants a 4% pay increase. That will cost hundreds of millions of dollars on an ongoing basis. How are you paying that? Especially since you have to, out, of the, out of the corner of your eye, you have to be aware that the government's revenues could fall or has fallen. So you know what happened? Talk to the Minister of Finance. Again, I said the PNM stand alone. When we looked at our situation in 2016, at the Hyatt Hotel, we called the fraternity in energy and business in something called Spotlight and Energy. I'm sure you all forgot that. At that, I as Prime Minister said to the world, to the energy companies, that we are unhappy with our arrangements and our earning arrangements. We had experts to look at it, to give us facts as against fiction. And I said to the country and to the world, Trinidad and Tobago will open conversations with these companies that if their shareholders are benefiting especially from increased profits, then my shareholders, who are you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, an arrangement has to be arrived at where you too have to benefit. As usual, the reaction was negative from our people. The Prime Minister is chasing away foreign investment, and the Prime Minister is going to interfere with contracts, and la 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 la. 
Anyway, as a result of that initiative, which was announced there, your government spent months and a number of trips home and abroad to talk to the people to whom that was aimed at. And the end result of that is that a hole in our national budget has been filled by billions of dollars which were not there before. <laughs> at the next meeting of the PNM, at the next meeting of the PNM, I will have the Minister of Finance on the table and he will tell you what our position was and what it is now and what we're looking at going forward because you the people you need to know that because you see it is in your ignorance if you keep yourself in ignorance you don't care you don't want to know it is then that you would listen to the unc's kamla pasad bisesa naked julian john and other miscreants you know. And you will think that they're, they're serious or they have something to contribute to. You know. But the other word that, you know, she uses is shame. I want to tell Kamala Prasad Bissessa tonight, I am glad to hear that she knows that in the lexicon there's a word called shame. Because if I was leading a political party, which the record showed had stolen so much money from a people, and then the courts would have ruled as to who stole that money and how much they stole and found them guilty, albeit years after they were put on charge. And I had come out and said that the whole Piaco airport was a hoax and it was PNM persecuting their political enemies. And you now have to tell this country that your party's record is one of how much billion dollars you stole by deliberate action. Because in case you all don't know, that Piaco Airport project was initially a PNM project. It was supposed to cost 75 million US. When we looked at the revenues from the airport, and I, I could tell you because unlike other members in the cabinet, this young lady and this one and this young man, they were not there. I was there. I was there. Kabil was there. She was a little girl then. <laughs> when we looked at it, the revenue stream could not support a loan of 75 million US. So we reduced it to 65, I think it's 60 or 65 million. But the long and short of the whole story is that by the time the UNC came in and took over the project, they entered into the agreement all faultily for an upward price of 105 million US. That was the project. That was the project. And there was no real problem then with them having a little increase in the price of a different project. Government coming, government has to be responsible, government has to be given a scope to make the decisions. 105 million US dollar contract. We had issue with how the contract was awarded. But in terms of the scale of the project, we didn't have any issue with that. Uh -huh. By the time they were finished with that project, they added another 150 million US dollars on it. Let me bring it down to TT for you. It was supposed to be just over 600 million dollars. By the time the finance books in the Ministry of Finance was finished with that project for what they had sucked out of the Treasury, it was 1.6 billion dollars, a thousand million dollars more. That is what Kamala Prasad Mr. should be ashamed of. Mr. Shib should be ashamed of. And what is worse, what is worse, when people were identified as having done that, and who should be in the dock in the court, as they were in the dock in, in the Miami court, you had your Kamala Prasad Bissessa government coming to the parliament, I was still there, telling the parliament that they're going to make adjustments to the law. And those adjustments were to improve the dispensing of justice in the country. But little did we know, it was a deliberate attempt to change the law so that people who were on charge for this criminal conduct would be able to evade the court. Section 34 was brought into being by Kamala Prasad Bissessa and the UNC. And today she has the unmitigated gall 
to be calling my name and mentioning the PNM name in the very said month that the Miami court find all of them guilty. Guilty as charged. Charged with what? All kinds of heinous crimes of fraud and theft from a little people in the Caribbean. And the political party under whose tutelage and encouragement they did that, behaving as though it didn't happen. As for me, I lived that from the beginning to today, and I will never forget them because that was a record in corruption in any country. <laughs> what you have to be careful with, what you have to be careful with, human beings make mistakes. We are all human. We're not all thieves. But human beings make mistakes. When you are a leader... And people in your group that you lead or that you represent, when they fall short, what is expected of you? You are required to identify the fault. You are required to stand on a higher plane and say, while John has done that, John doesn't represent us by that behavior. And we condemn his behavior. And there should be accountability by John. That's what you expect of leadership. Not in the UNC. The leadership provides a pathway for the wrongdoers to escape accountability. That is why Section 34 was brought into being, so they could escape what they have done. And worse, you become the mouthpiece to lie to the country and say that the whole Piaco investigation and prosecution was political persecution. You become the mouthpiece for the criminals. Tonight, I could tell you all, and I keep telling you all, all along, you all might not believe me. You see, as Prime Minister, because I'm the Prime Minister, and because I am head of the National Security Council, I know a lot of things that you all don't know. And, of course, in some cases, I am restrained by the court from telling you what I know. In other cases, even basic decency requires that I don't tell you. Don't mean I don't know. You would have seen a former commissioner of police who knows very rara and always has some comment to make. Entertained by the local media. is a go-to man. I don't want to engage him because he wants to engage the PNM. The PNM has swatted aside 63 of those already. But the, but the point I want to make to you is this. You would have seen the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Chairman of the National Security Council, being taken to court. I was in the court as a defendant last March. Okay? Defending the action of the Prime Minister, Chairman of the National Security Council, where a request was made to the court to prevent the Prime Minister from telling the Parliament what the Prime Minister knows. I want to repeat that. The Prime Minister was taken to court and the relief that was being requested was that the report that the Prime Minister had should be quashed because the Prime Minister had no authority to find out about that and the Prime Minister must not tell the Parliament. All I will say to you all here tonight, while all this national rah-rah, rah-rah going on, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that the Prime Minister knows that this individual doesn't want the Parliament to know? That's all I send to you tonight. And I'll say one more thing. In Tobago, they have seen, moon does run, but they are catch up. As I said before, on the corruption matter, Piaco and otherwise, because there are many more of that, eh? The wheels of justice turns and sometimes turns much too slowly. But they do turn. And when they turn, and in two and a half hours, a jury in Miami find all of them guilty as charged. And the leaders in the conversation in Trinidad and Tobago is, the real issue is how much, we, how much, how much the lawyers charge. How much, how, much they, how much they pay the lawyer? That is the real issue. Where are they leading you? 
So if somebody commits murder, and the murder case costs five million dollars, you can say, okay, you know what? That is five million dollars we're gonna lose. Let the man go away. That's what I'm telling you, you know. That's what I'm telling you. And you saw the other day, a whole, a whole group of them were before the court saying that they have no question to answer because the, state's, the state agency case had no basis. And that is after a judge already ruled that he didn't see any fishing expedition. He saw enough to go forward. The appeal, including a government minister, a loud, loud, loud government minister in that group, they've lost the appeal. The court has now said that they must proceed to answer the charges. I have no doubt that they will appeal because they all have their future linked to two developments. One, the Privy Council, and two, the next general election. They were hoping that we would have lost the 2020 election and all those criminal theft matters would have died. But you, the people, intervened and you gave the PNM an extra five years. Because the record will show that the Kamala Prasad Bissessa government for five years pretended that that matter in Miami didn't exist. No Would not give instruction to the lawyers. When we came in, I instructed the Attorney General and a commitment made to you, the people, that we will pursue white collar crime to the ends of the earth. If you've stolen money from the people of Trinidad and Tobago and there's evidence, we'll pursue you. And that came to the head when the lawyers in Miami asked that the, attorney, the former attorney general go to Miami as a witness, witness for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. He had to spend one month in Miami while that case was going on. And the woman who raises the word about shame, you know what they were saying about him when he was in Miami on that case? The most derogatory things. Not that he was there representing you, fighting for the money that they stole, you know. The Attorney General, um, the, the former the Minister of Local Government in the Miami, Lala, all negative. Because they were hoping that the case would have been thrown out. Because they had made so much rara over Amor. And we had to change our lawyers midstream and so on. They were sure that the case would have been thrown out. Tonight, I want to acknowledge the seminal rope done by Faris al Rawi who for seven years, seven years in office as Attorney General, stayed the course and delivered for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't expect our political opponent without decency to say anything good about him. But it's not always so, you know. When it was discovered that President Nixon had engaged himself in the Watergate matter. And he was now exposed to allegations of criminal conduct. He was a Republican president. You know why he wasn't impeached? You saw Donald Trump being impeached, right? So you know, you know what our impeachment is. You know why Nixon wasn't impeached? He was a Republican president. But senior people in the Republican Party went to him when the evidence was incontrovertible. The Republicans went to Nixon and said, Dick, you gotta go. That's how it is. That's what leadership does. Leadership ought not to be defending wrongdoing and defending thieves. But here we have in Trinidad and Tobago, the UNC exists to provide political and other cover for criminals. You heard about this issue with a particular person who had matters with the police and us and Barbados and so on. You heard that story, right? I, as head of the National Security Council and as Prime Minister, I first saw it in the newspaper. Then I heard from Barbados how it happened over there, where the Attorney General in Barbados went to the Parliament and gave testimony to the Parliament that was not refuted by anybody. 
Then you heard the Prime Minister in Trinidad Tobago coming to the Parliament. Because the two things I don't do easily, you know. I don't go to the Parliament and talk because I want to talk. And I don't sign Keith Rowley because I like to write. When I do that, it has to be important and well considered. I went to the Parliament and I told the Parliament as Prime Minister, I know nothing about this. I'm not involved. My government is not involved. I know of no ministers involved. The Minister of National Security had gone before or after and said the same thing as Minister, that the government knows nothing about it. But like the government of Barbados, we said if there is a problem where the state is at fault, the state will have to honor its liabilities. That's the law. What does the opposition leader do? The opposition leader and other interested parties who shall remain nameless for the moment, leading a war against the police service, inferring all kinds of manima by conspiracy theories, all in the benefit of people who have interest in the police. Until it reached the point where the opposition leader of Trinidad and Tobago of Section 34 fame is now the champion defender of a person who the police was chasing from Trinidad to Guyana to Barbados to Miami to Greece. That's the opposition leader. And then writes the police officers, writes the police officers in a public letter to not trust the prime minister to not trust the minister and to not trust the leadership of the police service. You tell me if that is not meant to undermine the confidence and morale of the police service and who will benefit from that? Who will benefit from that? Tonight I tell you, this is just another attempt by the UNC being the UNC standing in the breach for criminals. And if you, the people of this country, think that is a joke, let it happen. Let it happen and see where it's going to take us. How could you want to represent people, but you only come alive when it's time to make manima over somebody who have problems with the law, and you are the greatest lawyer in town. Eh? You who hypothecate a, 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 a senior council title and talking about shame. They have nothing to talk about, you know. They have nothing to talk about that is good. Every Monday morning in this country, somebody getting an honorary doctorate for something. I never hear anybody question anybody doctorate from any university. But I, who have my own doctorate from my own work, from my own experience, a woman who stole a senior council title, questioning my title. No, you know they could not be serious. You know they could not, but they had to be saying something even when it embarrasses the country. How could you so embarrass the country? Look at where we are today. They always want to undermine this country's prospect and its programs. Today, Trinidad and Tobago was elected unopposed. to sit as the President of the United Nations General Assembly in the for upcoming meeting where the world meets, where all the countries of the world meet to discuss the various problems of the world. Friends and foe, we are in the chair conducting that business. And I want you to understand what that means. When Trinidad and Tobago in the last 24 months decided to go down that road. We knew that we'll have to contest for it. When we put our name up, ask yourself how we end up unopposed. It is because the rest of the world 
who had candidates that they could have put up, said to themselves and among themselves that since Trinidad and Tobago is offering itself, we will support Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Go and look at a map of the world and see if you could find Trinidad and Tobago. And when you see that, look at a map of Angola, of Russia, of South Africa, of Congo, of France, of Germany, of the United States, of Argentina, and ask yourself, how did this little island get this reputation and this regard to be held in such high esteem that the rest of the world will say, if Trinidad and Tobago is running, we will not contest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today is one of the proudest days in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to thank and congratulate our team because this is teamwork. Because when Dr. Brown came to me and told me that we should embark upon this mission, I must tell you, I, wasn't, I didn't have the appetite at that time for the fight. And he told me it wouldn't be a hard fight. I said, well, okay, you all can go ahead. And they got cabinet approval to proceed. You know the UNC tried to teeth that too? <laughs> yes, Rodney Charles. Dopey saying is when he was there 10 years ago that he put that in place. Something that I had to approve and to be convinced by Dr. Brown to go forward. I said, do we have a candidate of stature who can stand that? Because when you're going for those positions, it's the whole world up against you. Know? The whole world. Some of them, the names bigger than the size of our country. And they went. And Dr. Brown, Ambassador, Dennis Francis, our team at the UN, and our friends. Most importantly, Trinidad and Tobago has a lot of friends in the world. <laughs> Even as I was not sure how it was going to go, three days ago, Dr. Brown informed me that the German government indicated three days ago that they will unflinchingly support Trinidad and Tobago. That's how it is. It doesn't happen every day. So when it happens, savor it. Tell your children about it. Let them feel good about themselves. Of every race, color, creed, class, or geographical location in this country, today is a proud day for Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> but left to them alone, they will find a way to denigrate it. That's what it is. And if that is the case, to whom do you look for the future of this country? You want to, you, you want, you want to improve and reform local government. To whom do you look? To whom do you look? And they're so worthless. You know, in the last local government election, I was campaigning in Siparia. And on a public platform in front of the superior crowd, I told them about the local government reform that we were engaging and what the government was going to do. And that the next two communities that would be elevated and that should aspire to be elevated to borough status would be Diego Martin and Siparia. And the people of Siparia supported it. In the corporation of Siparia, they voted to have their status upgraded to borrow, the corporation did that in Diego Martin as well. You think the UNC, which is in charge of the Siparia Corporation, would support their people in the council and come out and at least, you know, join them in this elevation of the status and make it work for them as improved management and so on and so on? No, no, no. They go on trying to get them to change their vote and asking us in the parliament, who authorize us? to give Siparia borough status and what does borough status mean is a name change. And people who are running interference for people who thief billions of dollars from this country, the big production in the parliament by her is to come with a list of the cost of changing the names of all the streets and she count all the streets in Siparia Corporation is 404 and you have to go and change all the names and change the paper on, on the letterhead. You who encourage 
and run interference for people who stole billions. Coming to waste my time to listen to you in the parliament talking about changing letterhead. Barely how much time you change letterhead? You understand? They're on foolishness, you know. They're on jokes, you know. We are on the business of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, I grieve danger. <laughs> My watch has stopped. <laughs> so I thought it was a little earlier. <laughs> but I think I've said enough tonight. Except to say that we have done what has to be done to continue the progress towards local government reform. There is one singular issue in this local government election. Are you for reform? or are you against the reform? That is the singular issue that we are going to the polls on. If you are for the reforms to continue to improve the quality of your life, you should vote for the PNM on election day. If you don't agree that local government reform is worthwhile and worthy of your vote, and you vote for the UNC, that means you are saying, you are saying that you want it to remain the way it is. So that a corporation like Sangri Grandi, after election, one of the biggest parts of the campaign last local government election was in Grandi. Big crowd, big set, big this, big that, results, UNC win, PNM get to, uh, good. After election day, people in Sangri Grandi can't use the playing field because they can't cut the grass for the youngsters to play football on the field. They can't maintain a window in a building. You can't call them for a drain to be cleaned. You can't call, all they do the wait every time the Syrian set up, aha, uh aha, -huh, aha, uh -huh, because it's gonna have flood. And you can accuse the government of not cleaning drains. Eh? Minister, Minister of Works didn't clean drains. No matter how big your drain is, if the downpour is sufficiently large and sufficiently long, it's gonna overcome the drain, especially if you build in the dry season, in the water course, and when rainy season comes, the river doesn't flow uphill. So ladies and gentlemen, the vote is important. This year, we have a clear issue as to why you should vote. Local government turnout is normally low because people are not interested in what they call local politics like that. But this year, local government elections should attract your attention because the singular issue of whether local government reform would be proceeded with is in front of you. You vote yes for the PNM and you get it. You vote no, that means you're voting for the UNC to maintain the status quo, create loopholes for people to be in office on fraud charge and still chairing the corporation under them. People could be in Sandy Gandhi on fraud charge for interfering and collecting bribe. You're still in office under them. You of the PNM know if you put God out your thoughts and nasty up your name like that, you're on your own. You will not be allowed to nasty up PNM name. But for them, that's a requirement. That's it. So it's crystal clear. We are going to campaign. We're going to knock on your door to remind you, and I'm saying to you here, the PNM, don't look for any big set of meetings. Don't look for instant of noise. Put on your red jersey, follow your candidate, walk the streets, knock on the doors, tell them why, and it is about local government reform. Single issue. Do you want a corporation that could kill the rats and the mosquitoes? Do you want a corporation that will have the revenue stream to be able to fix your roads and keep them fixed, them counting potholes? But how do you fix potholes or prevent potholes? You need to have the resources at the local level. You want your farmers to have agricultural access roads. You want your schools to be maintained. And you want programs in your districts which you don't now have. Local government reform. Go out there and offer local government reform and ask the people to support it. The time for local government reform is now. And the only party that makes dramatic changes for the better in this country is the People's National Movement. And that is why we say, that's what we can always say, our record is good. 
Our record is a champion's record, and we are the PNM. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM, and we shall prevail. Even though